Hi guys, I thought I should set the scene for this week as we're looking at adaptations and how um, animals and plants change to suit environmental change and therefore it's a, it's a basis of natural selection and evolution which we'll, we'll get to eventually. Um, but for now, let's just introduce this idea of, of adaptations. So we have three types of adaptation, structural, behavioural and physiological. So structure is just that, it's the anatomy, you know, it's the physical features. Um, so it can be things like skin colour, which confer protection in hot climates and things. Um, one of the great examples in Australia, of course, is what we call xerophytes. These plants that have to live in really, really tough, dry conditions and have ways of, of structurally hiding their stomata. So this image here is trying to show that here's a, a little pit on the inside of the leaf. So on the outside here, there's none of these. This is a stomata, I should put that in. Um, there are no stomata out here. This, this area faces the sun. The leaf then curled, oops, a strange hand motion, um, to create a tube-like effect. And then inside the tube are these pits to hide that stomata. It's all about reducing water loss. So if you create humidity in the pit, well, arrow's going again, um, create humidity here in this little pit, and then there's humidity inside the leaf curl, and that all slows down the process of water loss. Um, and of course, you can close off the stomata in, in really stressful times. So this is a structural change to the plant to survive. Um, we also have things like physiological adaptations. So these are uh, processes within our metabolism that allow us to do things better. Um, so some snakes and insects and other animals make um, venom. Uh, so you've you know something to protect themselves or to kill their kill and stun their their prey. The uh, snail there in the photograph is showing it how it can produce slime. So we don't see snails around the dry times. They're in a wet surface between their foot and the surface they're on. So they come out when it's raining, but they also create this slime below their from their muscular foot that allows them to slide across things. And in our case, of course, we're able to maintain a relatively stable body temperature between 36 and 38 degrees Celsius and maintain our biochemistry because of that. So these are physiological adaptations. Oops. And the final group is the behavioural adaptations. And there's a huge range of behaviours. Um, those of you doing psychology have a bit of an advantage here because you've probably looked at quite a few of them, or will be, um, the idea of imprinting and things. Um, so this, this rabbit here is um, huddling away inside its burrow because it's trying to keep itself warm. Um, it, actually, rabbits are quite interesting. Uh, rabbits in Spain are quite thin animals and smaller in comparison to rabbits from Siberia, which are much bigger, fatter and furrier, furrier because they need to try and hold on to their warmth. And of course, they all show that huddling behaviour. They'll get down their burrows and huddle together and, and maintain themselves. So these are a mixture of behavioural there and structural adaptations. Now, those adaptations are, cr are caused by changes in their environments. So we talk about some environmental factors such as the tolerance range. So I've put a little photograph here, well, picture of picture off the web, showing where an estuary meets. So an estuary is where we get fresh water flowing in along a river, and the ocean salt water flows in this way. And of course in this area the two mix. So some animals, some fish are quite happy in the fresh water, and as they hit this salty plain, they disappear because they can't tolerate salt water. Others are happy in the salt water, but they can't tolerate fresh water, so they disappear. And those other animals here in the middle are obviously highly advantaged because they can cope with both. Um, so there's tolerances of the factors they live in, pH, temperature, um, sunlight, yeah, those sort of things. Some of these become limiting factors. And uh, I suppose a classic limiting factor at the moment is Everyone's got quite keen about removing old trees and keeping their themselves safe from bushfire. But of course, when you do that, you remove an enormous array of nesting sites for animals. And this becomes a limiting factor. They, they need a place to nest. Um, there are a pair of wedge-tailed eagles in the, res, in the quarry reserve at, at uh, Mount Elias at the moment. And they've been nesting there for a few years. But they would be the only pair in the, for a couple hundred square kilometres. They tend to take over that whole space because nesting places are, are hard to find and they won't, won't want to compete with others. Um, and these, these concepts here sort of 
develop a distribution pattern for where you can find certain animals on certain plants and how many of you'll find. So it reduces um, abundance of the animal as well. Um, I don't know why I put up the adaptation there. What I put it there for? So there are oh yeah. So these adaptations, of course, allow them to uh, find, but to increase their tolerance range, to cope with their limiting factors and survive or change with, when the environment changes, if they have to. And that's, they might involve evolve in a completely new species because of that. So there's a few environments we need to think about. Clearly, one is a lot of animals live in water, and water is um, a bit of a difficulty actually. So Australian inland waters range between 6 and 9 pH, so the organisms that live in there must tolerate that range, which is not bad, so we're talking about sort of mildly acidic to mildly alkaline, so it's a pretty reasonable um, pH range to have to deal with. In Australia, our temperature ranges aren't enormous, we don't freeze, so we don't tend to have frozen waters. You do get some frozen lakes in the Alps in a really good year, but generally we don't, so you don't see people skiing on lakes, uh, sorry, um, skating on lakes in Australia because the ice probably isn't thick enough to support them. Um, but in the north, you get that sort of stuff in the you know, northern hemisphere. <clears throat> but you do get still get fluctuations in temperature from summer to winter. Um, and of course, light. Light's very important. And light needs to be able to penetrate for plants to photosynthesize and bacteria to photosynthesize. And blue lights it can actually penetrate to about 20 meters if you've got very clear water. But all other um, wavelengths diminish quite quickly which of course means you don't have those photosynthetic animals at the base of your food chain. Um, and it limits all other life as well. And so we see some really quite interesting adaptations to living below 20 metres. Uh, the marine environment, of course, is a fascinating space because, of course, it's quite dynamic. We've got cold, fresh water bringing sediments in from the, the, the land, uh, seawater coming in from the oceans with uh, food in it, and uh, yeah, so we see a really dynamic space with uh, rocky platforms and coral reefs all developing. And so there's many different uh, niches for animals to find space to live in and uh, and the needs they have there, so for food, shelter, uh, yeah, there's enough sunlight. So it's a quite a dynamic space with lots and lots of adaptations being seen amongst the animals that live there. Um, and then we get on land, so the terrestrial environments. And again, we see a wide range of terrestrial environments from this photograph here of a rainforest. Um, through the grasslands, the heathland at school, quite a, quite a wet heathland in the reserve and a dry heathland area, and the open woody grasslands. These are all very, very different. And they offer different amounts of light, they offer different amounts of food, different amounts of water, and they all change throughout the year. So animals that, and plants that live in these spaces need to be able to adapt and cope with these broad ranges. And of course in Australia, well, across the world now, but generally we've got some pretty obvious ones in Australia, there are disturbances. And those disturbances can be us going in there and clearing a forest to grow a farm um, or clan, you know, grab the timber. But of course, we also have those natural ones. So we flood quite regularly. We have flooding rains. We have periods of drought. And of course, last summer we saw fire at its worst. And our plants and animals need to be adapted to cope with all those changes too. So we have lots of adaptations in our, in our plants to deal with fire. Uh, and for the animals, it, you need to be able to move, migrate somewhere else, which is, of course, what caught a lot of animals out in the summer. There was nowhere to go to. So there's a lot of massive death in our native and farm animal populations because there was nowhere else to go. Um, so that's adaptations. And uh, we'll chat more about it in class.